exciting. Um, we've had um, over 30 register for this call, and so we're excited about uh, the great platform that is coming out of this midday cafe. And so whether you're an enthusiast or a practitioner that's using it in a professional way, uh, this is an awesome space to connect. So um, thanks for keep coming back and, and tell your friends about it as well. I posted the YouTube channel link in the chat. So if you want to subscribe and see some of the calls we've done before, uh, make sure to check that out. But just a couple of things I'll be posting. We have some great uh, Great Lakes region upcoming trainings coming up. And so Dr. Jerry Wagner has one in June and one in July. And so I'll post the registration links for that. And then also the IEA Global Conference is coming up in Cincinnati. And several of us will be there for that July 20th through the 22nd. And the next month, and Claire's going to highlight this again at the end, so if we have people hop on later, but we're actually going to be doing a live event. And so we're going to call it the Great Lakes Joy Hour. It's going to be on Friday, July 20th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. And we'll be posting on a specific location in Cincinnati for you. But if you're in the region, if you're at the conference, or just even close to the city, we'd love for you to come and meet you in person. There's nothing like... Um, we love the Zoom platform, but there's nothing like getting to sit face to face and uh, share stories and uh, Enneagram moments together. So we'd love for you to be a part of that. Um, and so I think really, I'll, like I said, I'll be posting those links in just a few minutes. And so I want to turn it over to our Great Lakes Region uh, Board President, Claire Lorridge. Hey, oh, look at that. John Knox from Texas. You're not from the Great Lakes, but we're so happy you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, wonderful. So Erica, we're going, we're not going to be together during happy hour in Cincinnati. We're going to be together for joy hour. And, and so what's the difference? Well, Claire informed me this morning that the clarity of when it switches over is 530 is still happy hour, 630 is joy hour. And so just so you know, I learned something new this morning, but uh, just passing that wisdom on. Uh, and uh, and so we really do hope that you'll join us in Cincinnati. It's going to be a great time to gather together and uh, and share what we've been experiencing at the conference. And we really have no idea what's ahead for us in that week, but we know it will be good. We know it will be very good. But today is um, our uh, let's see, it's our sixth midday cafe of 2018. And we have the special guest speaker of Ginger Lapid Bogda, uh, who um, our first connection as a Great Lakes region was at Loyola University in October of 2017. And at that time, Ginger and Peter O'Hanrahan actually gave us a, a, a wonderful workshop on relationships reimagined. And uh, during that workshop, uh, Ginger gave us a couple of hints around the new book that she's released called The Art of Typing. And she'll be talking to us about that today, so we're pretty thrilled. This internationally recognized Enneagram author, this wonderful consultant, keynote speaker, coach, she is considered a world leader within the Enneagram. And her insights have been helping form organizations and individuals uh, for many years. And, and we know that uh, she's good friends with our beloved Jerry Wagner. And so um, we just want to welcome you, Ginger, and, and say thank you so much for taking your time to be with us. We know uh, even a young man from Australia uh, commented on our Facebook page and said that I recently participated in Ginger's Art of Typing workshop, and it was profound. Ginger's knowledge has led me into deeper understanding and accuracy of typing, and it reinforces the need for accurate typing so that the power of the Enneagram for growth and transformation can be found. So that's from a guy in Australia from down under. So Ginger, you know no bounds with this work, and, uh, and we want to thank you for being with us. Oh, thanks so much, Claire. Appreciate it. We appreciate you. How are you doing? I know, are you tired? Where did you just come from? Well, I was just two weeks in San Francisco doing certificate programs, and in the last eight weeks, I have been in the office three days. So it's been interesting, but I am not sleep deprived, and I didn't get sick, and I had a good time. So. 
And is it around this, uh, this fantastic book that you're doing the work? What's, what's happening? No. no, I do um, certificate programs that are trained the trainers teaching underground teachers how to train the underground in uh, work applications. So conflict, communication, feedback, teams. And then I do a specific uh, train the trainer on leadership based on what type of leader are you? Another book, but then I also do coaching programs and I'm also just starting to do some sort of specialized programs. I did a three day, just only underground program for people in India who none of whom knew the underground. That was much easier than some of the programs that I teach where people think they know the underground and they think they know their type, but they're missing something. You know, they're missing some depth on it. They don't understand certain parts of it. They focused on maybe some behaviors, but not on the deeper ego structure issues. So um, it's been challenging, but reinforcing about why I wrote this book, The Art of Typing. Yeah, and that I think is the big, the big deal here. Because when you wrote this book, um, you were really looking at the mistyping issue right. in the Enneagram world. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah, I'll talk about it a little bit. You know, when I teach coaches or I teach trainers how to teach the underground, if they don't understand their own type and the system, it's going to be very hard for them to teach it to other people. That's where I first caught this, where I was getting a lot of people saying, I need, I know I'm not that good at typing and I know I need more. What can you do to help me with this? And as I started doing this, you know, working with the book and working with this issue, I started to see how really pervasive it is. Not, I, you know, not that everybody's mistyped and I don't go around looking for mistyped people. I really am looking to teach the Enneagram and how to use it in systems. But if people are mistyped, it's a problem because they can't use it for their own development, uh, personally, professionally, spiritually. And if you're teaching the Enneagram and you're mistyped, the probability is that you're going to minimally miss, incorrectly teach two types, the type you think you are and the type you actually are, and maybe more too. So, you know, I'm pretty passionate about this topic now. And so I really appreciate being asked to do this. Yeah. Well, we'd like to just open the floor to you to, you know, begin and take us on a journey and then we can ask you some questions. Okay. So I can do my screen share. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me share my screen. And right there, Shelly. Yeah. Okay. Now my poor screen, but here we go. They just see your PowerPoint. You're going to see my PowerPoint. Can you all see that? Yeah. All right. So I started this with um, 60 to 65 percent. And why did I put that number? Well, that's because my experience when I get people in programs where people already think they know their type, I'm only getting about 60 to 65 percent of the people who actually, when it plays out longer, have their type accurately. And I'd say of those you know, the 40 to 35%, many of them, when they learn more about it, figure it out on their own, but some don't because they are like, start being over identified with the type that they don't, that they think they are, but is a, not the type they are. And it may be a lookalike or a wing or something. Um, and I find this true. And I've heard also uh, one time Russ Hudson and I were on a panel together in another country and he said the same 60 to 65% too, which is my experience. And I was talking to a very good friend and colleague, Anne Murray, who's out of Minneapolis, who does a lot of inner teaching and helping people find their type. And she, that was Sunday, and she was 60 to 65%. And I did two internal train the trainer programs for two different organizations where people already thought they knew the system and they found their type from tests to different tests that are well known and well respected and that turned out to be the about the percentage of people who had their types right so it just seems like if you're using a test if you're using panels if you're using just you know lecture if you're using and you know, that that seems to be about what's happening out there um mm -hmm. anecdotally i'd say but it's not just my experience and for me the enneagram is so important and it's so powerful and it's so central to our 
own personal and, and professional and spiritual development, but also so central to increasing consciousness that that 65% is not enough for me. Hmm. And so I ended up writing this book, which I, did I want to write this book? No. Uh, did I enjoy writing this book? Yes and no. Am I really happy with this book? Thrilled. It came out, you know, better than I imagined it would because it, the better it got, we made it better and better. And so anyway, so I just wanted to share some of what's in the book for people and then really address questions people have. So is, if it's okay, I'll go into my PowerPoint. Yes, please. Okay. So that's the book. All right. And so here's one of the graphics from the book. And so fundamental to this is we often refer to the underground as a personality system. And I think that that's how most people out in the world when we're teaching it would understand it. But when I started to really think about what some of the challenges are in getting people to type, get their type right, I realized the Enneagram is not personality. Because what is personality? I started to actually look this up and, you know, so, and I tried to simplify it. But if you look at the picture, the personality are like the leaves on the tree. And they are, the personality is behaviors that are repeated, repetitive behaviors, you know, which are things you can see. Um, and traits, which might be things like hardworking, um, generous, uh, private traits, but that get repeated. But the problem for this behavior and traits in the Enneagram, thinking of it as personality, is that there are several types that share similar behaviors, but for very different reasons. And there are also several types that share similar traits. So, for example, um, if we think about um, being, um, as a trait, being optimistic, well, we know that the sevens and nines and twos are all the optimistic trio, and threes can be optimistic, and sixes can actually be optimistic, and you know, it's not really specific to type. And the idea about behaviors, acting responsibly, or working long hours, or those sorts of things, those can go with several types. But what's the issue is the behaviors or the traits get repeated. The types do it for different reasons. So you can't, if, if it were simply behaviors and traits, it would be much easier to create and measure type. But it isn't because you, can, you have to get to the underlying motivational structure. Mm -hmm. Right? So then the next thing that's talked about is character structure. And those have to do with what's called, you know, more moral qualities. Somebody's lazy, which you consider a bad moral thing, you know, or somebody is honest or somebody's deceitful. But the problem for us in the Enneagram is that we don't really judge or we shouldn't be judging these sort of qualities. And when we use the word like deceit for three, it doesn't mean you're a lying person. It means you're not, you're believing your own press releases and you've come to believe that you're, the image that you created is yourself and deceiving yourself from what's your truer essence. It's not lying. I sometimes do programs, I did one in Hong Kong, which really shocked them, but how does each type lie? Oh. <laughs> it was really fun. Okay, oh no, we don't lie. Everybody says, I don't lie, and everybody hates lying, but I have them first go around and go, so what, define lying, and I have them type groups from each of the nine types. And so they all have nine different definitions of lying. And then I go, Okay, so that was interesting because then it got, I had them do it again, but this time, how do people of your type lie? And of course, by their own definition, they aren't lying, but by another type's definition, absolutely. Nine different versions of how we, by type, do lie. And so, in that sense, the Enneagram is not about moral qualities, good or bad. So what is it? Well, you get to the, it's not the trunk of the tree, it's the, basically the roots of the tree. And so it has, you know, what is each type's false reality? The ego structure. And the ego structure is the, the fixed way that we tend to view ourselves, see our interactions with the world. It informs all of the ways that we could sort of construct our realities. And it's composed of a lot of factors, including a false reality that each type lives in, a particular worldview, 
an ego ideal, which I borrow lovely, you know, carefully and respectfully from Jerry Wagner with his permission, how we see ourselves, this is me, this is not me. The longing, there's a deep longing that each type has, it's driving them, there's an avoidance, there's specific defenses we use, there are the mental habits called fixations, the emotional habits, which are passions that actually grow out of some of the areas in the left, and then behavioral habits, where you're going to see more repetitive patterns of behaviors, but it's in the subtype behavior. It's not in the type behavior. So if you're with me that the ego, stru ego structure is what type is, then when I go into in the book is that there's nine ego structures, one for each type, an ego ideal, a false reality, a thirst and avoidance, an unmet longing, a worldview, and a primary defense mechanism. Now, um, so the defense mechanisms actually are taken from, we all use multiple ones, but there's one that goes with each type that holds the ego structure in place. There's a deep unmet longing that is driving us and we're often not even aware of what that is. Then there's a worldview that is very unexamined. We just assume this is how the world operates. Our kind of ego structure creates a sense of, a sense, it's called social construction of reality, but it's really an ego stru structure of reality. And you get into false reality, the ego ideal, and then the thirst and avoidance where we're all driving towards something and away from something else. And if that isn't enough with an ego structure, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's complex. I mean, but hey, we're in this. I think the, um, the Enneagram is not for the superficial. Mm -hmm. It's for the people who want to understand. I do not think it's too complex. I think it's robust. That's how I see it. So there's thought patterns, which, which think of those as the fixations, the emotional patterns, which are the passions or vices that go with each type. And then the three subtype variations and sometimes people get their types wrong or their subtypes wrong or don't quite get it because it, one of the things that I see way too often is that people think, oh, I like groups, so I must be a social subtype. Or I have food in my refrigerator, so I must be self-preserving. <laughs> or I have one-to-one -one relationships, so I must be a one-to-one. -one. It's actually the, sub, it, the instinct is a movement toward or away or ambivalence about that particular instinct and it combines with the passion or the emotional pattern of each type to make a distortion of the instinct mm -hmm. and then you get three different versions of behavior mm -hmm. does that make sense or i wonder if anybody has questions about that yeah i was wondering ginger are those um consistent with karen horney's uh toward away and against no okay no, and the Hornavian groupings, I, I like her work and everything, you know, in the literature on the Enneagram, you know, different uh, authors use different configurations of trios to say, this is Karen Hornai's work. Mm -hmm. But this is more not about Karen Hornai in, in that sense. It's just more that in this instincts that <clears throat> we might have a movement toward something or away from it or have ambivalence. Most social subtypes have an ambivalence about groups but they may move toward them and away from them as well. And then if you think about, if you're familiar with the um, self-preservation four called Reckless Dauntless, yeah. it's a way of dealing with their suffering, right? Um, by suffering, suffering in a stoical way. And, you know, I, I suffer, but I don't complain about it. So, you know, find me non, not deficient and love me. But they go away from self-preservation by doing sometimes risky things, sometimes exciting things, and sometimes being a little reckless, particularly with finances and such. I, I know many self-preserving fours, and it's not always like this with self-preservation fours, but they'll relate to this. It's like they might collect money and then they spend it all, and then they accumulate more money, and then they spend it all. Now that would be a little bit reckless from another point of view, but not from them. They kind of find it fun and it makes them happy. And, Okay. Does that answer your question, Claire? Yeah, thanks. Okay. So I thought I would just show one of the ego structures from the book, which is the uh, type nine. It doesn't look quite like this in the book because we have a little different structure. But so here we have the ego ideal is the peaceful person, the false reality, false harmony, 
the thirst and avoidance, the thirst for harmony and comfort, avoiding direct conflict and ill will. The longing is to know that they matter enough to speak their truth and to take values-based action. The worldview is everyone deserves to be respected and heard, and I have to enable this. And the narcotization is the primary uh, defense mechanism, which isn't about narcotics. It's about diffusing or numbing oneself to what they're feeling inside in order to kind of keep things copacetic or agreeable or um, comfortable. So, because I want to go to the narcotization in sec section in this section, um, because the thought patterns and the emotional patterns relate very well to this. So the thought or the fixation is called indolence, which is mentally diffusing your attention so you forget what's important. And mm -hmm. then you forget or don't think to what are my opinions. And the emotional habit is called laziness, but it's a not laziness in a physical sense. It's a lethargy to paying attention to one's own inner experience, the feelings, thoughts, and needs from this, thus dis disabling action from the inner core. So then we, you know, we got very graphical in this book uh, because we wanted to hit the right and the left brain. And sometimes uh, seeing something makes it hit home. And that's what I was trying to do here. So the three versions of nine, appetite is the self-preservation. Participation is the social nine. Fusion or union is called, is the one-to-one -one nine. But it's about blending, narcotizing, blending, merging with others. It's narcotization through blending or merging. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, in order to have a sense of feeling whole, but it's, you're sending your energy out there. And so you're getting your sense of wholeness from outside yourself. And that's what blending or merging is. So the self-preserving nine uh, blends or merges with comforts and routines. That's hence the rocking chair. Yes. You know, they kind of rock themselves in comfort or, my ex-husband, who's a self-preservation nine, he um, used to like routines. He had his morning routine. And if his morning routine got changed, uh, never on his, from his doing, uh, he would be disrupted in the day. And every nine, I think, has some routines, but this is more common in the appetite version. His version was he had to get up, then he used the bathroom, then he did his exercises, then he get, went out and got the newspaper. Then he took the dog for a walk. Then he sat and had his breakfast. And he liked to sit at the same place at the table every day. And then he would shower and then he would get ready for work. And on days when the newspaper didn't come, he was like he was out gonna have a bad day because he didn't feel quite right, mm. right? Or when he first got married, I didn't realize that he had his seat at the table. So, and I'm like a two. So I'm like, well, let's see what the world looks like from this perspective. <laughs> I wasn't realizing that I was torturing the poor fellow uh, and he would like, he wouldn't say anything, but I, you know, something was wrong and I'd say, what's wrong? And he wouldn't say, but I was in his seat. Mm. It took me about five months to figure that out. Mm. Okay. Then the blending or merging in the social mind is called participation where they blend or merge with group by getting involved in merging overworking and working um, on behalf of everybody so that it's a way of feeling like they belong to the group or they are not a, you know, kind of an outsider in the group. And then they get very stressed and they don't even realize that they've done this. And then the fusion one-to-one -one is merging with uh, the significant other. It could be a partner, it could be a child, it could be both, it could be um, the dog, <laughs> that sort of thing. But it's about fusing with another and it may be multiple others. Whereas for the social, it's a fusion with the group and for the or merge and the, the self-preserving is uh, the merging with routine. Activity. Wow. So Ginger, can I ask a question? Totally. So my husband is a nine and he's on this Zoom call. Well, I gotta be careful then. <laughs> No, you've got to be careful. Uh, right. And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering, Scott, when you're looking at this, um, do, do the graphics help you see your subtype? Uh, and uh, do the words help you see your subtype? He disappeared. I'm so surprised. No, I'm here. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hi, Scott. Yeah, I, hi, Ginger. I, I absolutely love the graphics. They are helpful. 
Um, you know, I, I, I feel like I have always found myself in the self pres nine, mm -hmm. but in seeing this, I, I certainly, I kind of feel like I'm merging with all three types here, mm -hmm. subtypes, so, <laughs> which isn't unusual for me, but yeah, the graphics help a lot. And, um, I just love uh, what you're saying. I, I certainly find myself in all of those subtypes, but uh, yeah. So I let me comment to that, Scott. Um, let me comment to that. So when yeah. subtypes were first taught, I think you're raising an important issue I want to highlight. Yeah. When subtypes were first taught, and um, it was taught that we had one subtype that was our primary, we had a secondary, and then one that was dormant. And people talked about, well, we're getting our needs met in the act of the dominant, maybe a little subdominant, but we're not getting our needs met in the dormant one. But first of all, I think that's not true because the one that's dormant, it's not really means you're not, if you say you're dormant is self-preservation, doesn't mean you don't eat, you don't have, you know, things over your head. I, you know, it, the subtypes by definition are neurotic. <laughs> Instincts are not. So, the meaning that needing uh, safety and security, human need, needing right. community, social groups, human, and needing one-to-one -one relationships, definitely human. But when it mixes with the passion or vice of the type, it takes a different direction and we keep going after something that, and never getting satisfied, that's the definition. Now, that said, when um, Claudio Naranjo, who I think has really is the master of subtypes because he's been working with so many decades. He, when I went to a, a an extended subtypes program with him, he said he used to think it was dominant next and then not so uh, active subtype, but he's, he thinks that we may have two active subtypes. And one, they might be equally active, some might be more active at different times in our life or different circumstances. And when I'm teaching, um, doing my certificate programs and coaching programs and et cetera, I do um, explain subtypes and work with people in the group to try to figure out what theirs are because it's so important in typing because certain subtypes of a type might look more like another type. You don't have to be a master of subtypes if you can understand them basically and then figure out what the ones that might be mistaken for another. But I've heard more people lately say, that they do relate to all three subtypes mm -hmm. of the type. And so, you know, I'm somebody that's like, okay, I have this idea that it was one stacked order, and then I learned that it was two, and that made a lot of sense. But I was hearing that from people, that it's two active, and now I'm hearing it's not the most common, but a lot of people relate to all three. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you for bringing that up, because yeah. I think it's important. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. So in the book, besides going over the ego structures for each type, uh, I pres uh, offer uh, three questions that you can ask if you know, if you can narrow type down to two types, which we often can, no matter what you're using, or sometimes it'll be narrowed to three, and then I try to figure out, help them figure out which one is, which of the three we can give, put aside, because that's probably not likely. Then, if you can narrow it to two types, what I offer in the book is, and this is a lot of practice, um, I can tell you where that came from, but it's pretty funny, but okay, three <laughs> different questions where you can ask if somebody is not sure if they're a two or a nine, tells you why they might be confused with each other. If, could it be by the center? Could it be because they're part of the optimistic competency or intensity trio? or some other behaviors. And then three questions, here's the three, but below them in the book, it's like what to listen for when, if somebody is a one or there's two or somebody's a nine, because you can ask good questions, but if you don't know what you're hearing, it won't help you get to type. I didn't want to put what to listen for here because we'd, they'd be so long and everything, but you know, in type two versus nine being liked, it's really about twos, it's really important that they're liked and by people that they are, want to like them and that people are important and they don't think that people would dislike them. Although they, they don't like people, they just like to, dis, to like them because that sets up a problem for a two. If I'm a two, if somebody likes me and I really don't like them and I might not show it, 
I feel like I have to be really nice to them and I don't want to be, that's tough. Okay. But anyway, so in, in twos, it's a bit, there's a lot of attention to being liked. In nines, it's not about being liked. They're just, they're very agreeable. They're affable. They get along with people, but they don't spend a lot of attention or time figuring out, do somebody like me? Do I like them? It's really not in their mind on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. Second is the question of friends. You know, if you ask a two versus a nine, how, what role do, do friends play in your life? Twos have a lot of language to this. And often circles of friends that they describe friends for this and friends for that, and friends that that, uh, friends that long time. They can go on and on. And nines have friends. I, I, I don't know if Scott, you think this is funny, but my ex-husband, the nine, um, he would be asked to be a, a best, best man at weddings of people he hadn't seen in 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, asking somebody to be your best man means that's your best friend, right? But he just got along with people so well, and they thought so well of him, and he kept relationships. And but it wasn't he just didn't think about being liked and having lots of friends, although he had lots of friends. And then the other is knowing what others want and need. It's a third question. So sometimes what I'll ask people as if somebody a version of this question is, do you like to give people presents? If so, would you rather figure out what they want and then surprise them? Or would you like them to tell you what they want so you can get them what they want? Mm -hmm. And most twos will say, I don't want to be told. That feels like a demand. I get the fun out of figuring it out and getting delighting people. Whereas nines will say, sometimes I can figure it out, but if you want something, you can tell me. And if I can find it or want to, I'd rather you be happy than I give you something that would not make you happy. So it's kind of like that. Okay, so Claire. Initiating questions, really, really good. So Claire, tell Scott what you might like in a nice way for uh -huh. present, and that will get you more of what you want. <laughs> okay, so in the book, we also have graphics to sort of show the, one of the distinctions, and there's copy in the book on the two versus nine that would explain, you know, make this have context, but um, what this is meant to be is giving versus receiving gifts. Like twos love to give gifts. Sometimes receiving them can be a little more challenging. Uh, but in nine, they like to receive gifts. They also like to give them. But again, the two would be paying attention to this nine has a collection of globes. So the two is going, all of a sudden, found a globe that the nine doesn't have. And that two is wanting to give it to the nine. And the nine's simply delighted. So that's what that's meant to be. And then in the seven versus nine, because I did the ego structure on the nine, so I picked the two and the seven to do comparisons because those are part of the optimistic trio to seven, nine, and two, and they can get confused. So I thought this was good. So, all right, uh, there you go. So in the questions, it's storytelling. Now, the way to nines tell stories in sevens is dramatically different hmm. so okay so in 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 seven they tell start the story with, where it's really interesting to them and they pop around and they get excited and that's nice and nines tell their stories usually in sequence starting in the beginning setting context and moving forward and why do they do that well why do the nines start in the beginning because they think the context will tell you a lot of information about the story and to understand the story you have to understand the context and then they go sequentially. So they won't, don't want to leave anything out. They also, for them and for you, where sevens get excited and these tell the story, what's exciting to them. And they pop around. Well, I bet you and Scott, Claire, you're seven. You know, uh, uh, it's a high mark on Jerry Wagner's test, but no, I'm a three. You're a three, okay. Um, so then you don't have to, cause I was just imagining if you were seven, how you and Scott would tell stories to each other. Okay. <laughs> Next is interruptions. Um, so in types, you know, how do you define an interruption? See, sevens like to talk and they talk over people. It's a, a symbol of a, a, an indication of excitement. It means you're listening to them. And if they talk on top of you, it means they're excited about what you're saying. That is not an interruption from the seven point of view. But from the nine point of view, you're supposed to let people finish what they're saying. It's rude to say something while they're saying something because the person hasn't completed what they thought and how could somebody be really listening respectfully if you're 
talking on top of them. So it's two different styles. Um, and then three is attention diverted. So this is something that can be confused because in nine, sevens and nines, attention can be diverted. But in seven, it's about new shiny objects, new stimulating things, new exciting things, et cetera. Whereas the nines divert their attention by what, you know, the narcotization or diffusing when they're feeling pressured or tense in any way, or there's something they're not quite sure what to do, or they feel like somebody's demanding they do something, they will go off and do something that provides them some comfort and relaxation. So it's a different kind of thing. Okay, so, and this is the seven and the nine graphic, which I, you know, one of the things about the graphics, we have one graphic for every pair and we, our criteria, well, one of our standards was we had to look at it and if it we had to make us laugh continuously because if we didn't keep laughing, it wasn't funny enough because maybe we'd laugh the first go and everything. And I mean, I think this, this one I still think is really funny. Um, and many people don't even know what the seven is doing, but there is apparently this new water toy that, you know, you rev up and then it shoots you up in the air. And many sevens have tried it. <laughs> and a nine's not, that's not, you know, quiet day at the beach. No. So that's then, Scott right there. Sorry? <laughs> that's Scott right there, sitting on the dock of the bay. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I use the Otis Redding song, Sitting in the Dock of the Bay, Wasting Time. Uh -huh. as a nine song. Mm -hmm. It's not wasting time, it's relaxing. Okay, so when we ju I just thought I'd show you a few more of the graphics. Enjoying a gourmet meal. You know, it's like the seven's eating some of everything and the one's very proper. Yeah. And the going to a birthday party, the two and the five. <sighs> Navigating a maze. And what this is meant to show, and it's it, you can it's written in the copy, so it makes a lot of sense. But you know, threes want to get to the end, and they want to now figure out the most effective, efficient way to get there. And they don't really anticipate there's going to be lots of obstacles. So the threes all of a sudden figure out how to get beyond this obstacle. Whereas the sixes are living in a world of maze, and they like to figure out the pathways. So they get excited figuring stuff out as long as it's not overly complicated. They get excited, they get nervous, but it's fun for them. Ginger, I love, this is Teresa. I love the graphics. I'm such a graphical person. Yeah. And these, are, these are cracking me up. I love these graphics. This is my favorite of all of the graphics. <laughs> we had somebody in my, one of my programs in the last two weeks who said, you know, my husband had this kind of dog and I had a poodle. And this is exactly what we did. So this makes us laugh. Okay, so let's see. And this is another one. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. And so I think that's, um, Shelly, I stopped my screen share here. Yes. And now I think I'm back. Are you back? I am back. Beautiful. So, Claire, I'm yours for whatever you want to do with the time we've got. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think what I'm seeing in the sidebar is people are saying, how do you know me so well? And, you know, these graphics confirm that a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'm yeah. wondering if anybody would like to ask Ginger a question. Just raise your hand and Teresa will unmute you. They can also just unmute themselves and speak out and we'll kind of navigate it from there. So we'd love to have a few questions or comments. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me or not. This is Randy, mm -hmm. but uh, I wondered, can you talk about the differences between a five and a nine similarities and differences and how you understand uh, you know, how do you type them? Well, I think I can speak to why the two types might be confused and then how to unconfuse. Okay. Because I think you st the starting place is, you know, how are people learning this whole, all the nine types and then sorting, you know, five and nine. Okay. 
So now one of the things that is sort of like on one level, how could the two types be confused? And on the other level, of course they're confused, right? So I'll start with how could they be confused? You know, nine is a body center type, five is a mental center type, right? But nine is the type where many nines are kind of vacated their bodies to some degree. It's called anger that went to sleep. And when anger goes to sleep, anger's Anger is a feeling and it's got somatic experience in the body. And if you un unconsciously tell your body, go to sleep anger, which of course you're not really consciously saying, but go to sleep, your body will put itself to sleep by kind of having um, motions low level, like I, all of motions, sadness, anger, anxiety, even joy. I talk about sometimes metaphorically nines as like a radio where the volume is it, the music is on, but the volume's down. <laughs> so if you've got the volume down on emotions in nine, and then in five, you have, they've actually disconnected emotionally, that disconnect in real time, and then they go up later and have the feelings. It can be con confusing, but in nine, they don't go up later and have their feelings unless they're really distressed. In five, they will often go up later and have their feelings. So I think that's part of the distinction. Another distinction that I use is in five, they, um, they create a, an invisible boundary or moat between themselves and others that it's easy for others to sense that don't come in or cross the bridge to my castle unless I have invited you and I put the bridge down. Mm. So there's distance. Mm. Okay? Good. And in nine, there isn't distance. It's probably the type that creates the least amount of distance between themselves mm -hmm. and others. Nines give the sense to others that you can come up and talk to me. You can come into my space. So whereas fives need 50% more physical space between themselves and others than what's common in the culture, nines need less, okay? So I think that's a, also a, a good distinction. The issue though is, and so body type versus mental type. Okay, so, but here's a go. Some nines are quite intellectual. Mm -hmm. So if you get an intellectual and more introverted nine, they can mistake themselves more easily for a five mm -hmm. because of the introversion and intellectuality. But in five, I mean, introversion, as in the Myers-Briggs version of introversion, does is more correlated with five than is extroversion, but you can find extroverted fives. But this need to withdraw and recharge mm -hmm. one's energy, energy is so fundamental to the five. It's like a complete depletion of energetic resource. Um, whereas in regular introverts of any type, it just need to go away and recharge a bit and then come back. So I have a question for you. Do you think you're a five or a nine? Uh, no, we we have a friend that's been trying to figure out who she is for quite a long time, and she's confused. Yeah, what is she confused about? Does she say? Well, at, when is whenever she's taken some of the tests, she's about fifty fifty on the test. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know Sue can Sue knows her a little better than I do. What would you say? Yeah, I think um, these are really helpful to look at it that way. Um, because she, because of her background, she's a very disconnected emotionally person. Right. Um, very disconnected. And I think that's what's made it really difficult. Yeah. Very high, very high intellect. Yeah. Um, very, very smart lady. And I would describe yeah. her as a wise person. Um, right. But, and you can be wise without being a five. Yeah. Right. So that's the check. And you know that, you know, see the thing, and I don't want to, please don't share anything more about her in a way because I'm going to say something that might make you want to say something and I want to. Okay. Protect. Okay. Yeah. But, so if you have, if a person has trauma and there's a trauma overlay on type, mm -hmm. it can be more confusing for a person to find their type accurately because there's um, in trauma. If somebody, even somebody's, dealt with it to a large degree you might get out of touch with your body you might be um unable or unwilling to deal with feelings and keep them 
in a different place because you don't want to go there. So um, I really enjoy working with people who have trauma and helping them figure out type. And it's more complicated. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that's been helpful for me to have, I kind of realize is unless the trauma started be pre-verbal, you know, say the trauma started at five or six, I sometimes will try to help people go back to the time before the trauma started and remember that child and to figure, think what type would that child be? Sarah, do you have a question? I thought maybe somebody had unmuted, so I thought maybe they had another question. Actually, yeah. hi, this is, this is Bill. Uh, I started to write the question. I thought it easier to talk because I'm a two. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the 60 to 65 percent accuracy of typing. Um, do you find there are particular types that are more can um, more difficult for the people to accept or acknowledge? Meaning that they think they might be a, like the example of the five and nine, but I'm thinking more like you know a two and a nine. I, in my typing experience, nines kind of fit all the types. And so sometimes it's hard not to just kind of make them a nine, you know, because they kind of identify with all the various variables. So I kind of go into the, the kind of the underlying driver, that anger versus shame or, or fear. But do you find any particular types that are more or less likely to, and I hate to, I, I don't want to use the term accept, but kind of, you know, oh, I okay, I can see that. Like, I, I just, I, I just, I'm just curious because what, what, what's the driver of the mistyping? I mean, thirty, the thirty-five percent mistyping, or forty percent, I should say. Okay, well, you're asking three really big questions, so let me okay. see if I can remember them and then go in okay. order. Okay, they're all really good ones. Okay, so in the first case, the nine versus the two, or the nine mistaking him or herself for another type. In the blending or merging that nines do as a way of they vacate themselves and become the other, people tend to blend or merge with different types that they admire or find pleasant or agreeable. They will not blend or merge with people they find to be negative or complaining. So most nines have merged with a variety of other people and they may be attracted to certain types of, you know, sometimes they're attracted to the emotionality of the four. Sometimes they're attracted to the high spirit of the seven, or sometimes they're attracted, you know, it just depends, right? So whatever types they have tended to merge with the most, that's what's getting in the way of their self-identification of themselves as a nine. Um, Now, the second thing was, what types tend to, what have I noticed around people getting confused? Um, That's why nines do. I have noticed lately a, and this actually I've never been noticing for a couple of years. I mean, you get the twos and nines and the seven nines and you get the ones, threes and fives, the competency trios getting confused and the intensities, the four, six and eight, the sensory trio and helping them sort out fours are emotionally intense. Six are are running a mental intensity and eights are running uh, somatic intensity. But from the outside, sometimes they can't see the difference especially if you get some subtype stuff in there, but they can, they can sort that. But I have seen people wanting to be or thinking they're sevens when they're not. Um, and in a lot of cases, sometimes it's two for threes, but where, where did I just give you specific examples? I've seen um, some sixes, particularly the more counterphobic one-to-one sixes, with the strong seven wing that think they're sevens. And now very smart counterphobic or one-to-one sixes who have minds that are going really fast and they're thinking of new ways of doing things and new this and that. We can't confuse uh, that sort of synthetic hyper gear mind of the seven, which is just thinking about pleasurable, fun possibilities. Because the counterphobic six with a good mind can find new ideas that are more problem solving or pragmatic to be fun. So I think there's, that's why that, and I think for me, and I've, I've seen this happen, it happened in Australia, it happened again um, in, when I was in San Francisco, it's getting people to sort the fear. It's like, are they 
where, how do they relate to fear? What are they, what causes them to feel fear? Because remember, sixes are fear avoidance and they do it by pleasurable possibility planning. Counterphobic sixes are fear avoidant too, see the confusion, but they do it by either taking on big challenges, doing physically risky things, or just, just like, just doing something very big and very important and very exciting to them. So, but it's not pleasurable possibility planning. So I think it's about the counterphobic six and the seven can be confusing. Um, but so, but back to the question of why is there such a problem with the confusions of these things? Uh, I've been thinking about this a lot lately since I got back from my trip and I think there's several fold. Well, all of the tests, even they may say they're better than any other test or whatever, but they are better at getting certain types than they are at other types. There's, I don't know if they're still presenting themselves this way, but it used to be, you know, there's a 40% chance that you're this type and a, you know, and they could actually do statistics on um, where we find fours at a higher percentage than sixes because our test tests better for sixes. There's a way you can actually do some comparison of what people's types end up being and the test results to see how predictive, how effectively predictive they are. I'm not sure these tests share that anymore, but some tests were better at getting sixes and some were better at getting sevens and some were better at nines. And if you happen to be the type they get better, good for you. If you're one of the types that they don't get as well, you know, it's a problem. So um, that is a problem. And part of the issue is that when people take a test, they think the test, even with disclaimers, tells them their type accurately. Hey, the test told me this, so the test is right. So I think it's very important to work with people who do use tests to identify type, to have them know that they need to really explore it a bit further. It's just a potential direction. Then there's people who get told by a teacher or who they think a teacher told them. See, I'm not in there and you know, I, I understand it's hard. A teacher that says, you're definitely this type. There was a man in one of my programs in Australia who came to my, and he said 20 plus years ago, uh, an Instagram teacher told me I was a one. And so for 20 plus years, I've been a one. And then he said, I went to a program and it was run by, an Instagram program run by an eight. And she, she played a video that I don't think she'd seen fully through. And there was all this, war and guts and stuff. And she said, this was as a, as a type eight. And he said, and she's a type eight. And she said, this is even too much for me. But he said, he saw this video when he was shaking. He was so excited to see all the blood and guts and war. <laughs> Literally, he's talking about this and he's shaking. And I'm thinking, eights don't shake about that. They might find it distasteful, but he was like overly excited. So now he's decided he's an eight and he's in my program. So I'm thinking, I don't know if he's a one or not. I don't even know this man. I don't think he's an eight because he's shaking and so excited. And then when he started to talk about, because I had everybody go around and talk about, you know, what did you come here for? And everybody's giving short things. And he goes into, starts to go into a long contextual explanation of how he learned the Enneagram. So I just said to him, I knew he wouldn't like this, but I was sort of testing it out after about two minutes of this context. And the question wasn't quite answered yet. I said, so are you providing context to us? for understanding how what you want from this session and he said yeah so then I said well I know you're not going to like this but you thought you were one for 20 years and then you got all excited and energized I think you're nine could you possibly be a nine because you know you thought you were one then you thought eight but nine is the type that tells the story by context and he didn't like it at all. And he got, <laughs> it turned out at the end that he was absolutely, from his point of view, a nine. Oh. And he realized that all these collections and all these ways he'd merged and all this stuff. So, so that's another factor. Um, tell a teacher or miss saying at definitely or somebody hearing it that way. Right. Um, I think another factor would be people learning the Enneagram incompletely hmm. from somebody who doesn't, either know it completely enough to, to, to teach it or who's just passing it on, you know, not trying to be complete. And the person picks up a little something and grabs it and runs with that. Um, then there's the wannabes. I want to be this type. So I don't want to look at my type. And then there's the trauma. There were people 
I wouldn't call this big trauma, but little trauma. There were a couple of people in my last program who thought they were sevens, but one was a four and one was a six because there was so much pain and you know that they wanted and so from little earliest time they just wanted to be happy but they weren't they were pumping happy they weren't and sevens don't pump happy they just sort of emanate it i mean <laughs> it worked but they don't pump it up right. um and then there was a woman who was a thought she was a five and turned out to be a four but she had also suffered a lot and just you know just was kind of moving up through a wing as a way of finding some way of not being sad all the time because she had a lot of trauma in her early life. Um, so there's a lot of this reasons for mistyping. Um, but it's so common that I think it's important. Well, uh, yeah, Ginger. And I want to say it's so common that somebody should write a book on it. And uh, <laughs> so here's our... Here's our, um, here's our promo for the book. I love that some of you have it in front of you while you're looking at it. A couple of folks that just came out of my training and I recommended the book there and introduced them to your uh, optimism and intensity and competency trios. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, one of the things I, I saw Teresa put in the sidebar and we'll say this as a closing remark and I affirm it completely is that every helping professional should have this at their chair side. And, um, you know, and that uh, one of the things that I wrote to you the other day, Ginger, is I have it in my basket because as I'm sitting with someone, it's a really wonderful quick reference to ask them the questions. And so, um, so we're, we're so grateful for your generosity today. Thank you for writing this book, the book you didn't want to write, but that you're thrilled with. And right, that one. Can I say one thing? So yeah. a lot of, we had the concept for these graphics of the types. I went on uh, out of the country. My son, who's known the underground since he was five, he was tasked, he works in the office, he's not here yet. He was tasked with coming up with these scenarios where you could show it. He mm -hmm. did 75% of them. And Noah, Noah did all the graphics. So. Hey, hey, thank you. And Shelly, Shelly, show your face. Shelly did a lot of the proofing. Hey, Shelly, thank you so much. So it was a community effort over in our office. Well, it, it usually good things are a community effort. And so for those of you who will be with us at the IEA conference in Cincinnati, Ginger will be presenting there. She's one of the, uh, the major presenters. And, um, and if you're going to be with us in Cincinnati, send us a an email to the uh, to the IEA Great Lakes, um, and Jen, or, uh, Erica will put it on the sidebar, and we'll let you know where we're meeting for Joy Hour at 6:30 on Friday at the conference. And for those of you who won't be there, we're going to let you come on Zoom platform. So be watching for the newsletter. We're going to actually bring you into wherever we're having Joy. And, uh, and, and share the joy with you at 6.30 on Friday during the conference. So there will be no midday cafe next month, uh, but we will be joining together in the evening on Friday at the conference. And so all of us want to just say thank you. You have, you have given us so much here, and, uh, and we, we just bless you and pray that your journey be full of every grace and gift you need. I like that. Thank you <laughs> so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, Claire. Bye, Teresa. Bye, everybody. See everyone. <laughs> bye bye. So, Teresa and Erica. We have a couple of things that we could talk about for five minutes, if you're able. We have five. Yeah, let me get uh, everybody out that knows. Hey, Orion. <laughs> Good to see Hi, you. Um, see you, see you Leanne. Okay. okay. Scott's still here, but. Scott, our resident nine is. 
Yeah, is he, but is he really still here? I don't he think he's not, really, really still here. I think he's in creative team meetings. So, he just, <laughs> so I'm removing him. There you go. Okay. Hang on, I need to stop recording too.